In this video, we're going to learn how to apply crystal field theory to predict the magnetic properties of coordination complexes and the compounds in which they find themselves. Before we get there, though, I wanted to touch on the tetrahedral and square planar geometries. Our discussion of crystal field theory to this point has focused on the octahedral geometry, but tetrahedral and square planar geometries are quite common and give rise to different splitting patterns of the d orbitals and differences in the nature of high spin and low spin complexes as we'll see. So let's start with the tetrahedral geometry. The arrangement or the way the d orbitals are split by a tetrahedral field is different from that of an octahedral field because the geometry of the ligands, the geometries of those negative point charges are different with respect to the d orbitals. And in a tetrahedral field the d orbitals are split into three higher energy orbitals called T2 and two lower energy orbitals called E. Now, generally for a tetrahedral field, this splitting is quite small. One way to rationalize this is to recognize that the bond angles of the tetrahedral geometry are 109.5 degrees, and that's kind of weird from the perspective of the d orbitals, which are primarily, you know, primarily have lobes at 90 or 180 degrees, and so the d orbitals can kind of avoid the negative point charges, and the splitting tends to be relatively small. And so delta tet, the crystal field splitting for a tetrahedral geometry, is generally smaller than delta oct for a comparable metal and ligands. Because of this reliably small splitting, tetrahedral complexes are always high spin. The energy associated with pairing electrons is always greater than delta tet, the crystal field splitting in the tetrahedral geometry. In other words, this energy splitting is always relatively small, so we're always going to avoid pairing. For example, in a D4 case, we'd end up with a, a complex like this rather than pairing like so. So we always end up with high spin complexes with a relatively large number of unpaired electrons in the tetrahedral case. Square planar is yet another four coordinate geometry. And in a square planar situation, we actually get four different energy levels. It's not just two different distinct energy levels, so there's a, a sort of broadening out of the 5d orbitals into four levels, two lowest energy that are relatively unperturbed, more or less perpendicular to the square plane. The dz orbital isn't too bad, it's just got sort of the donut in the square plane and that's it. And then the dx squared minus y squared, well its lobes are pointed directly at the ligands, so it's destabilized the most, and dxy shows up in the middle. So we get this pattern of 1, 1, 1, and 2 energy levels in the square planar crystal field splitting. And in this case, the crystal field splitting is relatively large, so the pairing energy is pretty reliably less than the crystal field splitting for the octahedral, for the square planar geometry, which I've called here delta sp. So square planar complexes are usually low spin. For example, in the D4 case, we're going to end up putting all four electrons in these lowest two energy orbitals before moving up to the higher energy orbitals, since this gap here is relatively large in the square planar geometry as a rule. What does all this crystal field theory stuff have to do with magnetism? Well, electrons have a magnetic moment. They act like little tiny magnets. And in particular, unpaired electrons, electrons whose little magnetic fields are not canceled out by another paired electron of the opposite spin, have a big impact on the magnetic properties of any material. And because unpaired electrons are quite common in coordination complexes of the transition metals, this is an area where magnetism is very, very commonly seen. And with respect to magnetic properties, we're going to divide materials into two classes. Paramagnetic substances contain at least one unpaired electron and exhibit relatively strong magnetic properties. They're strongly attracted to magnetic fields. Diamagnetic substances contain only paired electrons. I like to remember this by the prefix di corresponding to two indicating a pairing of all of the electrons. Diamagnetic substances contain only paired electrons and they have essentially negligible magnetic properties, weak repulsion from a magnetic field, almost undetectably weak repulsion from magnetic fields, essentially not much magnetism at all. Now, how strongly magnetic a particular complex or compound is depends on the number of elect unpaired electrons within it. Since the more unpaired electrons we have, the larger the net 
magnetic moment, right? And so high spin complexes tend to have greater magnetic moments overall, greater magne measured magnetic moment for the substance as a whole than low spin complexes. And this is a great empirical way to measure the difference between a high spin and a low spin complex using something like a magnetic susceptibility balance to get a quantitative measure of the number of unpaired electrons. Let's see now how we can use crystal field theory and the number of unpaired electrons to answer what appears to be a very simple question. Is this coordination compound paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Keeping in mind that paramagnetic means we have at least one unpaired electron. That unpaired electron is going to show up in these split d orbitals. This is a coordination compound, so let's split it up into its component ions first, essentially throw away the sodium counter ions, and focus on this MnCn6-3- coordination complex. If we kind of unpack this a little bit, we've got a manganese 3, manganese in the plus 3 oxidation state. That corresponds to 4 d electrons. We're going to use that shortly. And we've got 6 cyanide ligands. And keep in mind here that cyanide is reliably a strong field ligand. So the crystal field splitting is going to be quite large. And we are going to pair electrons before putting them in the higher energy orbitals of the octahedral splitting. We know the splitting is octahedral here. We know we're dealing with delta oct because we have a six coordinate complex here with the six cyanoligands around the manganese center. So the split d orbitals are going to look something like this and now we're going to fill in with four d electrons. The fact that the cyanide ligand is strong means that once we filled in the first three we are not going to move up to the higher energy level. Instead we are going to pair that fourth electron with one of the electrons in the lower energy levels and end up with an occupancy like this and we end up with two unpaired electrons. Two is not zero therefore yes this compound is paramagnetic. Each molecule of the complex contains two unpaired electrons, each of which has a magnetic moment. The compound as a whole is paramagnetic.